I'm Steve Fisher. I've been a part of University Christian Church for almost 40 years. For almost 30 years, I have struggled with chronic anxiety disorder. It hit me with young daughters at home in the midst of my career. It became a terrible time for me, not knowing what was the matter those first five years when it went undiagnosed. I faced a trainload of health issues, panic attacks, digestive issues, muscle spasms, debilitating exhaustion, dizziness, vision problems, and weight loss. I sought out answers from over a dozen healthcare professionals during that time, but none of them seemed to have a positive result that would work for me, which only added to my anxiety. I, I tried to keep as much of a, a routine as I could and working and with home, and, but I remember one time driving, driving home from work uh, a little early. Uh, I'm driving down Sunset here in Manhattan from university, headed home, and I was feeling so lousy. I, I had a headache and my vision was blurry and I was feeling kind of dizzy. And I just said, Lord, I know that you say to be thankful in all things, so I'm just gonna thank you for feeling so lousy right now, but, but please let me learn what it is I'm supposed to learn from this so that I can move on. What kept me going was knowing that my God was in control. Even though I certainly didn't understand what was happening, and apparently some of the doctors didn't either, I had hope. I didn't give up. I had to finally change my local family physician, and he ran a couple tests that hadn't been done before and then we identified it as panic disorder. Once on the correct medicine, I started making a turnaround within days. Praise the Lord. The doctor said at that time that I would probably have to stay on medicine, which I have found to be true. So if you know that you are going through a valley of despair, don't give up. God is with you just like he was with me. He is faithful. He's full of love and mercy and grace. We are not alone. Before we jump into today's topic, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate those who have been sharing their testimony. I think it's absolutely amazing. And it's really powerful because it creates an opportunity for people who are sharing uh, to experience more freedom over the things that they've been experiencing, but it also encourages and inspires the rest of us to not be afraid to talk about the things that we're going through. Um, and as uh, Barry said last week, we also want to remind you that what the scripture, especially the, the parts that we're looking at, when they're talking about the idea of being anxious or worrying, they're not talking about clinical things like have been shared oftentimes in these testimonies. They're not talking about chronic anxiety disorder, general anxiety disorder. They're not talking about PTSD, OCD, uh, or as Rachel brought up last week in her testimony, depression. Uh, the scriptures aren't speaking to those things necessarily, especially when they're condemning them and asking people to do something different, to stop being consumed by those things. They're talking about something different, which we'll get into in a moment. And so because we love you and care so deeply about you, we want you to know if you are resonating with some of these uh, testimonies and feel like maybe you're experiencing some of the things that they are, we would encourage you to get some help with that and to go seek out professional advice on those things, whether it's a medical or a psychologist, psychiatrist, or a counselor, because as a church staff, we are not trained and qualified to identify, to uh, diagnose, and to treat those kind of things. Uh, so because we care about you, we want you to do that. In fact, there are four areas that we think are critical for people to be healthy uh, hol uh, holistically or collectively, and those would be, first and foremost, uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't think it's possible for us to become who we are created to be outside of that relationship. And so one thing that we do here is we teach people how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ through scripture and prayer and other things. And so if you would like to learn more about that, please contact me throughout the week, and I'd love to set up a, uh, set up a time where we could sit down together and go through that. Uh, the second thing is we believe that we are designed for community for relationship. So around here we have something that we call life groups, and that's kind of what we believe are for everybody, but we also acknowledge that life will throw us some curveballs, and sometimes there are circumstances and situations that seem to throw us off uh, and just upset the, 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 the apple cart, so to speak. And so what we do there is we've provided some ministry called care ministry because we know that things happen and people need special attention for certain things. 
So some of those things would be grief share. For those of us who have lost someone and we need to learn and have a place where we can safely grieve those things, the loss of the people that we love, and so we provide that. We provide something called divorce care. For those who are going through marriages that are either in separation or going through divorce, uh, we provide something called celebrate recovery, which is kind of a catch-all for people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, uh, which is really all of us. And what happens there in all of these places is we teach people to look at the words of Jesus and figure out how to apply that to their personal lives so that, again, we can experience the life that God has designed for us, which we're going to talk more about today. Also, there's a group that meets on our campus uh, for those who have lost a loved one to suicide. Um, but again, we believe that a relationship with Jesus Christ is important, being in community, and so we have care ministries for those. And then also, we do think at certain times it's necessary for people to seek out professional help from someone who is trained and qualified to do that. And again, we would much rather you go and seek that and get uh, have someone talk with you about that and them tell you, you know what, you're fine. Um, you can make a few minor adjustments and you'll be okay, rather than you uh, think that you're okay and just kind of press in and press on and make things worse for yourself or someone else around you. Okay, and again, we're just saying that because we love you. And again, uh, when we're getting into the scripture, in particularly when Paul's letter in Philippians, which we'll be looking at today, um, he's talking about the idea of being anxious or anxiety that comes from worry or being too careful or caring too much about certain things. And Jesus uses the same word, and Jesus' brother James uses the same word. So it's throughout scripture, and it's that idea of, of caring uh, overly uh, about one thing. And so we're going to jump into this. So a friend of mine several years ago, he was actually my boss for a while. Uh, his name is Eric, and he saw some things happening in my life. And so he sat me down and said, I'm going to talk to you about two things, a circle of concern and a circle of uh, 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 control. But first, I want to get you guys talking to each other. So what I want you to do is real quick, chance for you to be vulnerable with the people next to you. What is one or two things in this last week that you have been concerned about, that you have been worried about, that you have been anxious about in the last week? Okay, one or two things. You're going to talk to the person next to you. We don't have much time, so you get a whole 17 seconds. I'm going to cut you off, all right? Ready, cassette, go. All right, I gave you three extra seconds there, so you're welcome. Uh, so hopefully you've got that in mind. Now hold that in your head, what you talked about. So what my friend Eric did is he had me write down on a piece of paper, um, two circles. We start with a big circle, and it's called the circle of concern. It's going to be right here. And there's a lot of general topics that come up. So how many of you had something like in the area of family? It had to do with someone in your family. You're worried about them. Maybe someone in your family has kind of gone off the rails, and they've got some destructive behaviors, or they're doing some stuff you're not so sure about. Or maybe there's a relationship with a parent, a sibling, a spouse, or somebody in your family. And it's like, man, this is causing a ton of stress for us right now. How many of you, uh, it, it was with work? How many people have something they're concerned with with work, like whether you're going to get a job, whether you're going to keep the job you've got, what's going to happen, is the pay going to come in, maybe it's uh, your employer, or maybe you're the employer and your employees aren't doing so good, or coworkers, and sometimes there's stress and frustration there and we're concerned about what's happening. Um, how many, uh, maybe you have like a, a social thing on the world, maybe you're real big on justice, and so you're thinking about the plight of people who are, are poorer than you are, or you're thinking about human trafficking or refugees or all these kind of things. These are areas of concern in your life. Maybe it was political. Maybe you're looking at our political system and you're just up in arms about that. You're watching Fox News or CNN every day and you're just stressed now. Your blood is boiling when you're turning on the TV, seeing this stuff. And you're like, man, we got a bunch of morons out there or something. Or I'm not saying that, but some of you think that. Uh, how many of those like financial stuff, like you're concerned about how much is money coming in, your bills that you got. Some of you are in college. You're like, how many more loans do I got to take? Some of you have kids that are going to graduate high school next week and they're going to go to college. Like, how am I going to pay for this kid to go to college? All these things are areas of concern, things that we are concerned about that we can begin to worry about and get anxious about uh, and put too much thought and energy. We might wear a path in the carpet because we're pacing back and forth or just wringing our hands or losing sleep at night because of the whole deal. And reality is these are areas of concerns. They're not necessarily bad things or things that we shouldn't be worried about or things that we shouldn't care about. But when we become anxious, what's happening is we're giving too much thought to things that we can't control. And so then next, Eric had me draw a smaller circle and he put this, he labeled this as the area of control. Meaning, he asked me the question, John, what things do you actually have control over in your life? And these were the two that we came up with. My attitude and my response, meaning my response to the things that I was concerned about. So every morning when I wake up, I'm the one who gets to determine what my attitude is going to be that day. Not my circumstances, not how much sleep I did or did not get, whatever I feel like, all those kind of things. I get to choose my attitude. 
And then as I go through my day, as I bump into people in my family, people at work, as I think about social things, as I think about the political state of our country or the world or things that are happening, or as I look at my bank account or I'm concerned about finances, I'm the one who gets to choose my response to all of those areas of concern. And what happens, uh, if we take a few moments to, to talk to ourselves and think through this, if we're honest, what happens over here is these are typically good things or things of great value to, to us, but what we realize is there are things that we can't control. And so we start thinking about people in our family, we start thinking about our work conditions, we start thinking about all this other stuff that's happening in our life, and we can't control it, so we begin to become worried about it, and it creates inner turmoil, that anxiety, that worry, that stress. That can become uh, physical if we're not careful. And if it's in a relationship, so if it's with people at work or family or someone in our neighborhood, if it's in a relationship, what happens is if we try to control that or if we're overly concerned about it, it will create a rift in our relationship with those people. I remember when I was serving in uh, North Africa with my family. We were missionaries. I was a team leader for a very small team of missionaries. And there was one of the guys on our team. I'd been friends with him for a long time, and he wound up on my team. And uh, there was a lot of stress going on in our life. We were very concerned concerned about the people who lived there, uh, both uh, their poverty and the fact that none of them knew who Jesus was. And uh, there had just been uh, a political upset. There was um, an overthrow of the, the, the current government and all this kind of stuff. There was a lot of drama on our team. And so we were sitting there talking. And I had felt like, man, I've been pouring into this guy. I've been doing so much to develop him. And I was like, I bet uh, he's, he's really seeing me as a valuable asset in his life. And he sat me down and was talking to me. And he told me, uh, John, I just feel like you're always trying to fix me. It's like, oh, gosh, that really hurt, man, because what he was pointing out, uh, it hurt to hear that, but what he was pointing out is like, I was so concerned about him and what he was doing with his work and with his family that I began to try to control him and try to fix him. So as much as that hurt me, what was more enlightening to me is for me to realize the way that me being obsessed or fixated on things that are outside of my control, what it had done to someone else and what it had done to my relationship with them. And since then, that's been a rough relationship because of the way that I treated him, because I had taken an area of concern and become anxious about it and taken on a responsibility that wasn't my own. And it had messed up some things that were happening there. And so uh, that's what we're going to kind of dive in today a little bit. Now, uh, as I said earlier, I am neither qualified nor trained to speak on many of the ideas of clinical depression or anxiety. Um, and so knowing that, my friend Colin and I sat down with another friend here in town who is qualified to talk about these things, and he's an active counselor. His name is Dr. Greg Gilort uh, over at Manhattan Christian College. And so we were able to sit down with him and just say, hey, we just kind of threw all this stuff. We're doing this sermon series. We don't know what we're talking about. And we just kind of got into some stuff. And, and he affirmed that we actually don't know anything that we're talking about. So that was really encouraging. <laughs> Uh, but he did bring up this idea, like in the Bible, it does speak about this in general. It speaks about God's desire and plan for us. And he brought up this idea of shalom, which means peace. And so we're going to talk about that real briefly. But I want you to know that what I'm saying typically, uh, not typically, most of it comes from him or another website that I encourage you to go to called uh, thebibleproject.com. And these guys have some cool videos. They have one on shalom that will do a much better job explaining it uh, than I can do here briefly in a few minutes. So I encourage you to go check that out later if you're interested in learning more about what uh, Greg Glor was talking about. So this is the idea. So in the Old Testament, uh, the, the Hebrew word is shalom, and in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene, but they're both translated peace. So you don't really need to know those other languages. I sure don't. But uh, the point there is that it means peace, but biblical peace is different than what we think of, because a lot of times when we think of peace, we think of the absence of conflict. Here's what the Bible Project guys say. They say true peace or biblical peace requires taking what is broken and restoring it to wholeness. Taking what is broken and restoring it to wholeness. And so I thought this was pretty brilliant because as I'm reflecting on those circles that Eric walked me through, as I think about the things that are in my area of concern that I'm trying to have control over, those are things that are important to me. And as I look at them, I either think that they're currently broken or I think they have the potential to become broken. And so I become uh, uh, really idealistic. I fixate and I try to control and, 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 and just, yeah, control all of these things. And so what happens is, is, is I'm, I'm coming at approach thinking I'm the one who can put it back together. And that's the problem because I can't. But my desire is for those broken things to be restored 
to wholeness. And so that's the idea of what peace in the Bible is, not just the absence of conflict, but being restored to wholeness and completeness. And so I'm going to run through real quick a few verses that talk about Jesus and his relationship to peace so we can have a better understanding of what Paul's going to say to us. So here's the first one, John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You may have shalom. You may have irene. You may have completeness. You may have wholeness. In this world, you will have trouble. We all know that. And we have all experienced, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So it's in Jesus that we can experience this completeness and this wholeness, this peace that we're talking about. The next one says this. This is from Colossians. So this is Paul talking about Jesus. He says, let the peace, let the completeness of Christ, who he is and what he has done for us, rule in your hearts as members of one body. You were called to peace. You were called to completeness. You were called to be whole. And be thankful. And we'll get back to that later as well. Jesus again in John chapter 14 says this. Peace I leave with you. Completeness I leave with you. My peace. My completeness. My wholeness. I leave with you. And so this is the goal that the Bible is talking about. This is the Father's goal. This is Jesus' goal. is to bring us back to a place to restore what was broken to its wholeness and its completeness. The problem is, is when we look at our lives and our circumstances and the world around us, we have those areas of concerns, those things that we look at and say, that's broken or it's going to be broken, and we want to fix it. We want to control it. And what Jesus is saying is, no, I'm the one who can fix it. I'm the one who can make it better. Because Jesus didn't have an area of concern. He didn't have a circle of concern. Everything was his, and he had the ability to take control and to do what he needed to do with it. And that's what we're going to look at next. So if you have got a Bible or if you've got a device with Scripture, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, but before we get there, what I want to do is just remind us a little bit of who we're talking about. Paul uh, was a guy who was very uh, prolific and very successful in his previous religion, which was Judaism. He was a Jew, and he was uh, well-studied, well-educated, and very successful in what he was doing. And one of the things that he thought he would do to serve Judaism, to serve his God, was to squelch this little tiny movement of people calling themselves Christians who are following this guy, Jesus Christ, who Paul believed to be dead. And so what he did is he went around and just uh, locked these people up or had them killed or whatever the case may be until he met Jesus face to face. And Jesus was like, what are you doing, bro? That's not how it's supposed to go down. You're going to go be my messenger all these people that you think are dirty, filthy animals, and you're going to be a totally different person. So he starts doing that, starts with his churches, writes letters. He's in jail now because of what he's doing, uh, and he actually kind of wants it that way. So he's facing some hard circumstances. The people in this city, Philippi, they're in a place that's controlled by Romans, but it's not a Roman town. And so they're in this place where they're losing their jobs jobs or not getting certain jobs. They're losing their families. They're being beat and ridiculed. Some of them are being persecuted to death because of their faith. And so Paul is writing to a group of people who have a great big circle of concerns with lots of emotionally charged things in it, like, hey, is my family going to have enough to eat? Are we going to have a place to live? Are we going to get killed or beat up because of our faith? And you can imagine some of them are like, let's just give up on this whole Jesus thing because our life would be a whole lot easier for us. And so this is who's writing and this is who Paul is writing to. And before we get to chapter 4, what I want to do is read for you a little bit of chapter 3 because I think it helps us uh, get set up and ready to hear what Paul has to say. So here's what he says in chapter 3. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So let me just pause right there real quick. Um, I've talked about this before. When I read the Bible, uh, my paper copy and my digital copy have footnotes in it, and they put a footnote right there. And what I think is interesting is you, if you follow the, the footnotes, you can always get better context to what uh, the author is trying to say because they, they use it in other places. And so what's interesting to me is when he talks about people living as enemies of the cross, what he means there is people who are saying no thanks to God. I'm not going to live the way God thinks is best. I'm going to live the way that I think is best. And so the first thing that came to my mind when I read that is he's like, he's probably talking about people that have rejected the gospel, people that don't call themselves Christians. But if you look into it, I think there's a good reason to believe he's actually talking about people like you and me. I think Paul's actually saying there are some of us people in the church, some of people who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ, who have heard the gospel, said that he's Lord, got baptized, and are going, uh, meeting in people's homes, meeting in church places, and all this kind of stuff, and they continue to say, no. Nah. Now, they wouldn't verbally say that, but what they're doing is they're saying by the way they live their life, they have continued to do the things they used to do. And Paul goes on to, to, to elaborate. He says, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So this verse has been super convicting to me over the last couple of months because I have realized uh, that I love to eat. 
And if I'm not careful, my stomach controls what's going on, and really my tongue, because I don't eat because I'm hungry. I eat because I like to eat. And if I'm not careful, that's a bad deal. And so then he's talking about people like that, and he talks about their, their glory is in their shame. And what he's saying is the things that they used to do before they knew who Jesus was, before they got baptized, before they started following him, those are the things that they still delight in. Those are the things they continue to do them as though, hey, there's nothing wrong with this and this is okay. And so he's saying, he's wrapping it all up, their mind is set on earthly things. Their minds are set on the circle of concern, things that they can't control, things that are outside their realm of influence, and they are focused so much on those things. And then Paul goes on to say this, but our citizenship, we should be different, is in heaven, and we, have, we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that, he, that has enabled him to bring everything under his control was tran- will transform our lowly bodies, our earthly physical bodies, so that they will be like his glorious body. So this is powerful to me because he's saying that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We've already testified and we've already seen the fact that he lived, he lived a perfect life, he didn't mess up, he was killed on the cross, buried and then rose, came back from the dead, and went back to be with his Father in heaven, sitting at his right hand. And so because of that, that power that enabled him to do that, he is bringing everything under his control. So Jesus didn't have to worry about the circle of concern started following him. Those are the things that they still delight in. Those are the things they continue to do them as though, hey, there's nothing wrong with this and this is okay. And so he's saying, he's wrapping it all up, their mind is set on earthly things. Their minds are set on the circle of concern, things that they can't control, things that are outside their realm of influence, and they are focused so much on those things. And then Paul goes on to say this, but our citizenship, we should be different, is in heaven, and we, have e- we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that, he- that has enabled him to bring everything under his control was tran- will transform our lowly bodies, our earthly physical bodies, so that they will be like his glorious body. So this is powerful to me because he's saying that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We've already testified and we've already seen the fact that he lived, he lived a perfect life, he didn't mess up, he was killed on the cross, buried and then rose, came back from the dead and went back to be with his Father in heaven, sitting at his right hand. And so because of that, that power that enabled him to do that, he is bringing everything under his control. So Jesus didn't have to worry about the circle of concern versus the circle of control, because whatever he was concerned about, the Father, because of his obedience, has brought it underneath his control. But the hang-up is, you and I often think that we can do what Jesus can do. And so we'll try to bring those things in our circle of, in, of concern under our control, and we can't. And that's where the internal strife happens. That's where the broken relationships happen. And that's where the anxiety that Scripture is talking about begins to happen. So this is the context that Paul is writing to. And then he says this in chapter 4, verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving... Present your requests to God. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't be overly worried about anything. Don't be so wrapped up. Don't be so fixated. Don't be so obsessed with the things of this world. The things that you used to worry about before you knew who Jesus was and what he has done for you. But rather, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving... Present your requests to God. When I heard Steve's testimony this morning and him talking about the day that he was coming home from work driving and just remembering, God, you told me just to be thankful. So thanks for letting me feel lousy right now. He's praying this prayer. And he's like, God, whatever I need to learn from this situation, whatever you're trying to do in my life to make me More like your son, whatever you're trying to do in my life to get me to that place of shalom, of peace, of wholeness and completeness, help me to see what that is. Because I'm done with the brokenness and the anxiety. So what I want to challenge you to do this week is to look at that circle of concern and that circle of control and begin to do what Steve did. And begin to do what Paul's asking us to do. Just to start praying about it. Start talking to him about each of those things that are in there. 
Start asking him for help. And I think the trick here is thanksgiving. Because if we're not careful, if you're anything like me, what we start to do is when we get in these situations, as I start to pray, as I say, God, would you deal with this person and this person? Would you change this circumstance and this situation so that it's better or easier for me? And I think that's coming from a, a place of, to be honest, ignorance and selfishness on my part because I think I know what's best. Rather than coming in and saying, thank you for giving me salvation. Thank you for being bigger than the problems that I'm facing. Thank you for the fact that you want to use these circumstances in my life to help me to become like your son. Thank you for the fact that no matter what's going on, you are bigger and stronger and you will use that somehow to bring me into a place where I experience peace, where I will be restored to wholeness and completeness. If you're in the fill in the blank there, here's what we got going on there. Uh, thankful prayer overcomes anxious thoughts. Thankful prayer overcomes anxious thoughts. Because when we're thankful, when we're expressing gratitude to God or to someone else, it's hard for us to be focusing on the things that we think are overwhelming. For us to be overly concerned, to be overly anxious about things of this life when we are grateful to God and for the fact that we have a hope that is yet to come. Here's the next one. It says this, the appropriate moments to worry, none. And again, we're talking about the kind of worry where we believe that we can change the situation simply by being stressed out about it, simply by giving it a ton of thought and a ton of attention because we think that we can be in control. But the appropriate moments to pray, all of them. No matter what happens, talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. Here's the next thing says this. The most proactive measure we can take for any uncertain future outcome is to ask God for help. So again, if you go back to that circle of concern and you're looking at some of those things and you're thinking, John, you're crazy. You don't have any idea how big this is to me. You don't have under, any idea or understanding of how overwhelming this is for me to have this situation in my life. What I encourage you to do is just to start talking to God about it. Start talking to the one who thinks that you are strong enough to handle the situation that you're in. The one who has promised us that he would never allow us to get into a circumstance or a situation or a temptation that we cannot handle. The one who has promised to be there with us to the very end, to the very completion of everything, till everything is made whole, until we are experiencing full peace. In a moment, we're going to stand together and we're going to sing together. And the song that we're going to sing uh, is a song that I absolutely love. It's talking about this idea of being controlled. And for me, the first time I heard this song, it, it was very easy for my heart and my mind to connect what Paul is talking about right here and what happens in my life. When I look at the area of concern in my life and the, the reality that I can only control my attitude and my response to those things. And the idea is in the song, it begins to talk about how we can get so tired and we can get so frustrated, we can get so weak and worn down, and we, begin, we can begin to run from our circumstances and even in some cases run from God. God because we are trying so hard to make everything work and it doesn't work out that way because we're not in control. And then it talks about the moment in our life when we experience peace because we have chosen to surrender to who God is and the fact that he is the only one who is in control of all of our area of concern. And so what I want to challenge you to do this week is go ahead and to look at those things, to spend some time this afternoon, the things that you are concerned about, and begin to talk to God about and begin to thank him for the fact that he is more powerful and in control of those things, that he will use those things to bring about peace, wholeness, to restore us to what he has intended for us to do. And this morning, as with every Sunday, if you're at a place in your life and there's something that's going on and you just want to talk to someone, if you want someone to pray with you, myself and some of my friends will be back in the corner and we would love to hear what's happening and we would love to pray for you and help you take some of the next steps so that you can experience the, the peace and the wholeness that God has in mind for all of us. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning and thank you for making it clear to us that you don't desire just to take us out of the hard situations, but you desire to use those hard situations to experience the peace that only you can give, to experience the wholeness that we can only have in you. And so, Father, my desire this morning is that people would turn to you, that they would trust you, and they would start talking to you about the things that feel overwhelming in their lives. And, Lord, we ask that you would restore us to wholeness and completeness that we would find our hope and our peace in you and you alone. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.